Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Rock Sports Showdown. I'm your host, Kristen Karam, and alongside me are our sensational analysts, Cameron Collins, Doug Drew, and Big Dave Miller. There's been a lot of action this past week, so let's get started. This past Saturday, the Slippery Rock football team played host to Clarion in the fourth installment of the Battle for the Milk Jug. The Rock won the game by a score of 34-13, to improving to 6-1 and on the season. Dave, what are your thoughts on this game? They played an incredible first half, 20 to nothing going into the first half, scoring within the final two minutes and getting some big plays along the game. Trick play of the game was a flea flicker this week. Last week, the tight end pass with Robert Joyce. And overall, the, the offense was, uh, I wouldn't say stagnant at the, at the first half, but they put up enough points to win the game. And then you see later on in the rest of the game, in the second half, the weather started start to get bad and overall, the Slippery Rock's offense played a little <coughs> more poorly rather than, uh, and they also let Clarion score a lot more just because of the running game, and they couldn't keep the defense, the defensive flow going. But Slippery Rock played enough of a good half to win the entire game, so that's the only thing I'm worried about for the rest of the year, is they're only going to play like one strong half and then like kind of have a shaky half in the next half because you got to put them both together to play, get a full win, and they're just getting enough done in the first half to win in the second half. So I really enjoyed the game, and hopefully they can keep the momentum rolling because now they have sole possession of first place in the PSAC West. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> definitely agree. They uh, played a great game. Uh, big thing I would say is the defense. You know, uh, been turning it around these past couple games, you know, only giving up 10 to Kutztown, uh, 16 to IUP, and then 13 here to Clarion. <clears throat> um, and they had, uh, like you said, the weather got bad at halftime, and uh, Silberak came out in the second half and uh, threw an interception, gave them the ball on their side of the field, uh, fumbled a punt return, threw another interception, but they still only allowed two of those to go for scores. Uh, you know, they had the goal line stand on one of the other ones, uh, turnover on downs on the goal line, and so I think that's going to be one of the biggest factors going forward for Slippery Rock is that defense and the ability to stop teams when they get the ball on the, on the other side of the field. Uh, Clarion's, it was, I think it was their second drive, Clarion drove all the way down the field, uh, got inside the 10-yard line, and then Slippery Rock held them to a field goal attempt, which they missed, which you're going to have. So, you know, if you can keep them out of the end zone at least, you know, when they make those long drives, uh, Slippery Rock has shown the ability to score quick. And that's, I think, also going to be a big help because if you're, you know, down a few points late, you know, they have the ability to score in a lot less time. You know, they might only have a minute left. Most of Slippery Rock's scores on Saturday were under two-minute drives. So, you know, they have the ability to, to pull out that two-minute drill. I mean, Slippery Rock played great again, but I'd like to note that Clarion, I'm not sure what their rank is defensively, but they managed to keep us down to 34 points instead of us putting up 40 or more like we've been putting on teams. And we need to try to figure out how to fix that because if a team figures out what Clarion did right and try to make an improvement, Super Rock could have another tough couple games ahead of them. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, we were talking about that earlier today, um, you know, where we've regularly been putting up 40 some, 50 some points and, you know, only scoring. And I think that's attributed a lot to weather. I don't know what it is with this Super Rock team. You know, that one loss coming in Erie to Gannon in the downpour. And then, you know, Slippery Rock had, were clicking on all cylinders, and then it started raining at halftime, and they came out turnover, turnover, turnover. And it, the wheels just kind of fell off. And I don't know what it is about rain in Slippery Rock. I mean, they, they were able to run the ball, so, you know, you shouldn't really have to worry too much. But, but, yeah, definitely. I mean, Clarion did hold us down a little. Not held us down, but held us down to Slow less than usual. <clears throat> but... That's why I think that defense improving is a big factor because that's what happened in that Gannon game is they held us down and we couldn't stop them. But so as long as we're stopping teams like they've been the past couple games, I think they'll be all right if they're not putting up 50-some points. That's why I stressed early on, earlier on this year that defense getting it going is going to be a bigger factor. You'd figure with all the rain that we get in Slippery Rock, they get enough practice in the rain. Right. But you know, <laughs> as long as the weather stays fine, this team's going to be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just like like I said about the defense before, you know, Tony Papley had what fourteen mm -hmm. tackles on the day. Yep. Quindell Dean twelve tackles. Um, Gary Allen with Gary 12 Allen tackles. twelve tackles. So I mean, when you have guys, 
uh, getting in on that many tackles. I mean, every time Clarion tried to run the ball up the middle, you know, they were getting swallowed at the line. So, I mean, as, as long as this defense keeps it up, we know this offense is capable of putting up enough points to win games, and I definitely look forward to seeing us in that PSAC championship game at the end of the year. Tonight, the Pittsburgh Penguins take on the Colorado Avalanche at the Consol Energy Center. Both teams have started off the season hot and enter the game at 7-1. Cameron, what are your thoughts on tonight's matchup? Um, I'll be the first to tell you I don't really watch much hockey, but I do know that Sidney Crosby's on fire right now, and uh, Flurry has been great in goal. Um, so uh, I definitely expect a, a good game. Um, as the Penguins usually usually put out. Um, I know uh, Patrick Waugh is doing a great job, first-year coach mm -hmm. for the Avalanche. Um, like you said, both teams 7-1 and one right now. You know, still early in the season, but both starting out hot. Um, I, I look to, for uh, Sidney Crosby to, to keep it going offensively and uh, lead, lead the Penguins to the victory. Well, I mean, yeah, like you said, both teams 7-1. Good record so far in the season for each of them, but it's hockey. Anything could happen, really. The, those rowdy Florida Panthers beat <laughs> Penguins six to one. That's the one loss on their record right now. So, doesn't matter <coughs> what team it is. You got to take every single one of them seriously. So, it's going to be a good game, though. Two of the best teams right now. You mentioned the Florida Panthers loss just quickly. That was the backup. Backup goalie Zach yeah. off. And it wasn't and Mokun. Yeah, Mokun's out for three Whatever. to six months. But <laughs> aside from that. Watch out for the Panthers. <laughs> oh, yeah, and Tim Thomas. But, uh, and the thing about this matchup is that the Avalanche haven't lost on the road and the Pens haven't lost at home yet. So something's got to give tonight. The Avalanche uh, coming off, just they've been able to score all the time. And it's with, it's with young players. Uh, last year, the rookie Gabriel Landeskog, and now the captain this year, he's leading the team with in, uh, or second in the team in scoring. And they got the, the number one overall draft pick this year, I forget his name, and he's already got one goal with in a team high six assists. So, and they're almost like comparing right now to what he's doing to what the first seven games or eight games that Cindy Crosby did because he got all the assists before he started scoring all the goals for the Pens. But tonight, I see I see the Pens keep rolling. I, Flurry, after being pulled from the playoffs just to just for blowing up in the playoffs. I think that really ignited something inside of him. I, I saw a, apparently he saw a sports psychologist over the summer as well, so maybe that he got his mind like set, like focused on like actually like performing better. So I, I see the Pens uh, roll, into vic roll into victory, and it's going to be another great day for hockey in Pittsburgh. Or Fleury's just the Peyton Manning of hockey. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> just can't get it done in the playoffs. He, he already has a championship, and he's already lost a championship, so he has, already has Peyton Manning's track record. Exactly. So... Um, you could be the, the greatest regular season goalie to ever live. Can't get it done in the playoffs. And he, no, he's coaching for the Avalanche right now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh gotcha. Uh, Anything else? That's all I know. All right, yeah, that's, we're, not, we're not a hockey bunch here. <laughs> Jumping over to some college football, there's a new number two team in the NCAA, and it's the Florida State Seminoles. Number six, FSU defeated Clemson on Saturday and overtook the number two spot from Oregon in the B BCS standings. Doug, what do you think of the new rankings? Well, I've always thought the BCS needs fixed. <laughs> yeah, true. Like, like yeah. yeah, Alabama probably still is number one, no matter what those numbers say. <laughs> They're a pretty solid team by so what I've seen. So someone else you would put at number two then? I'm really not sure who should be at number two because, like, they're not even all in the same division, so it's really hard to match them up against each other unless they actually play each other. So once they start getting that playoff system, I think, does that start this next year or next year? Next year. Once that Top starts. Four teams. Yeah, once they start getting that figured out for the Bulls and all that, that's going to be when ranking is going to, I feel, get more accurate because they'll all get to actually play against each other to see who is the best, not just... Your number's this, your number's this, you play. Well, and it's still going to be flawed for the first little bit because I'm yeah. pretty sure they're still going to be operating off of, like, the BCS standings. They just take the top four teams and they play in a four-teamed tournament. So it, it, it at least gives two more teams a shot, you know, because that's, like, that's what's going to happen to Ohio State this year, which, I mean, it should. They play in the Big Ten. They don't really play anybody that stout, you know, so none of their wins are viewed as that impressive. 
and you could be like, well, if they played somebody like Florida State or Clemson, they might not be undefeated. And so I do, I do think, you know, they don't really play anybody. They're probably going to be stuck at number four all year, and they're going to play in some big bowl that's pretty much meaningless. Now that they're actually bowl eligible, but I mean that's that's college football for you. But um, FSU jumping uh, Oregon, I think it's I think it's the right rankings right now because there's still a few more games left to go and Oregon still has to play Stanford and UCLA in back-to-back -back games so if Oregon wins both of those games they're gonna jump back over Florida State if they and if they don't win those games and they don't deserve to be the number two team I mean if they lose one of those games and Florida State keeps winning then they prove that they deserve that number two spot um, Alabama still has a couple tests left still got to play LSU so um, they might they might lose they might drop down you never know we might see a shake up in the rankings at some point. Yeah. I'm highly impressed with famous Jameis. It's been a phenomenal year. He only had two incompletions his first game against Pitt, and one of them shouldn't have even been an incompletion because the receiver couldn't put his feet in bounds. <laughs> so it just he, he's putting up remarkable numbers. He in the Heisman running right now, uh, number four right now according to ESPN. I think he should be. Higher than Johnny Manziel, but yeah, definitely, and just by the numbers. But and you also look in Florida State's schedule and uh, ACC, and it, it's not a it's not an easy road. They just had to beat number three Clemson, but in yeah, so like you said, right now, they right do, now, they do right now is correct. Miami. Yeah, right now is correct with the with the first four, and if like you said, if Oregon can beat those two teams, and they deserve number two, maybe not number one, just because Alabama has been just so dominant. Just they need to play each other. Someone needs to beat Alabama to dethrone them. So it's all it's always a battle for number two now until Alabama gets beat. I'm just waiting for when we finally don't have to deal with just all this Alabama, Alabama, Alabama. Yeah. Like when are they not gonna be good? Never. Uh, hmm. Until Nick Saban. They need please. to get rid of yeah, they need to get rid of Nick yeah, Saban needs to go to Nick Texas Saban or something. A running back that was still in middle school at Alabama <laughs> dedicating is right now. Oh my word. So. He's, 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 he is the, he's the Bear Bryant two point it's ridiculous. But, yeah, uh, like you said, you know, we've had to deal with this. Well, who's going to be number two? Because we know Alabama's going to be number one. But uh, I think LSU is going to give them a test. And uh, hopefully uh, if Ole Miss gets to the uh, – well, actually, Ole Miss is in the same. They're in the east, I think. So I don't even, Missouri, I think, would be who they would square mm -hmm. off against in yep. the SEC championship game. So uh, maybe we can uh, – just hope yeah. that Missouri gives them a, a challenge in the SEC championship, well, and we can upset. maybe maybe not have to watch Alabama in another national championship game. Get your get your hopes high. Yeah, pretty much. All right, it's been a great discussion so far, guys, but we still have a lot to talk about. So we'll be back right after this commercial break. Welcome back to the Rock Sports Showdown. We have three more topics to cover, so let's get started. First off, the Pittsburgh Steelers won their second straight game for the first time this year, defeating the Baltimore Ravens 19-16. With the win, the Steelers improved to 2-4 and four on the season. Dave, what are your thoughts on the Steelers right now? I mean, they're rolling. They got two wins in a row, both, both scoring 19 in each game. <laughs> And uh, their defense, had, everything's getting that first turnover against the Jets, those two interceptions. It's really like bringing the defense like together. They're actually holding offenses to, like a low amount of yards. They're keeping the scoring limited, and they're they're getting like time, they're getting timely stops as well. Um, they're going into Oakland next week, which might be a little bit of a, a, a like stoppage in play, if you want to say that. But I overall, the Steelers they've been. They've improved since the bye week. I think that's really all they needed was just was a little time off after starting off rough, uh, not winning a preseason game, not winning a regular season game until week six. And just overall, I think the Steelers, they just needed a little time to recognize who they are. No, they're still awful. Uh, uh, yeah, 
but they're at least winning games, unlike some other teams. So this is true. Overall, I think <laughs> this is true. The, the, both the, the Steelers are out of playoff contention. It's just a matter of pride. For See, the rest I wouldn't of the even season. say they're out of playoff contention because the Bengals are what five and two. Yep. Okay, so the Bengals are five and two. The Browns are three and, and four. four. The Ravens and are three. And then the Ravens four. are three and four, and the Steelers, Steelers are, two and, are two and four. So the Bengals still have their bye week. You win on their bye week, that gets you another win. Everyone that closes else the gap. Has a bye week. Exactly. So that closes the gap on that because the Steelers have already had their bye week. I, I mean, I still think that division is wide open. I really do because the Browns still have to play the Bengals again. The Browns still have to play the Steelers twice. The Browns still have to play Baltimore again. Cincinnati and Pittsburgh still have to play one more time, don't they? So, I mean, I really I think that division is still wide open. You say out of playoff contention, but, I mean, we've seen bigger turnarounds in the NFL. I mean, I really I think the winner of that division is a 9-7, and 8-8 eight and eight team. So, I don't think any of those teams are out of playoff contention. It's going to be tough to win the division, but, yeah, like you said, it's still open. But especially considering, although the Bengals are playing good right now, they are still the Cincinnati Bengals. They just they can't perform in high pressure situations since I've paid attention to them. So like, but it's most of their wins have been really iffy. They beat uh, what was their score against New England? Like thirteen six. Yeah, that was all defense. I mean, which they was squeaked surprising. that one out. Well, here's the thing: it doesn't really matter how you win. The Chiefs have won two but, games now, but that's seventeen what I'm, to six. But that's what I'm saying is when you look at a team. Okay, well, when you look at Cincinnati's wins versus Denver's wins, what team gives you more confidence? Back back to the actual team, though. <laughs> I would like to mention that the Steelers' run game has greatly improved since Le'Veon Bell came back. He's been impressive, and he hasn't had like crazy numbers, even though he did have pretty good numbers over in London against the Vikings, but he has really helped the offense get rolling. I mean, he had 93 yards last game, and five yards into the game, he broke 100 for the season. So, I mean, we we're actually, the, the Ra Steelers and the Ravens were the 30th and the 31st ranked rushing offense this year. And they have, Ravens have Ray Rice and Bernard Pierce. So they're really depending all on Joe Flacco. But, I mean, overall, back to the Steelers, one team has made it to the playoffs starting out the year 0-4. That was the Chargers in the 90s. Very highly unlikely that the Steelers are yeah, going to make the Yeah, highly unlikely, season. but, um, but yeah, like, as you like you said about Le'Veon Bell, that's when the when the Steelers drafted him, I was extremely upset because I really liked Le'Veon Bell and I th really thought he's the best running back that came out of that draft. Besides maybe since watching him play, Giovanni Bernard from the Bengals, because yeah. he's got he's a good speed guy to compliment mm -hmm. Jarvis Green Ellis. But Le'Veon Bell, I think he's going to be a great running back and he's going to help out Pittsburgh's attack a lot take a lot of pressure off Ben and the passing offense. Um, but, yeah, so like you said, Le'Veon Bell getting it going was a big help in that win. And, I mean, like I said, as much as I hate Pittsburgh, I still think that division's wide open. I wouldn't write it off just yet. Um, I've been a Browns fan for how many years? Got, got to keep the faith. Don't tell the host that you're a Browns fan. Yeah, don't tell her I'm a Browns fan because, you know, she gets angry. <laughs> Peyton Manning's return to Indy was spoiled last night as Andrew Luck and the Colts defeated the Broncos by a score of 39 to 33. Doug, what do you think this mean wins for Denver and Indy? This is good for them. I mean, second year for Andrew Luck, and he's really proven that he deserved that first pick over RG3. Just their whole team did pretty well. I want to. The defense kept getting to Peyton Manning, which is the most important thing because that's what screwed him up especially that uh, safety, that's when the game really changed because Peyton was on a roll until then. Mm -hmm. And so looks like, like most good quarterbacks, if you just hit them around enough, you can get back to that team's level. And Andrew Luck hasn't lost in consecutive starts since being drafted by the Colts so, so far this year. And losing to the Chargers last week and then bouncing back against, at the time, the best team in the NFL in and a homecoming appearance for Peyton as well. And, uh, you know, well, quickly a shout out to the Colts fans for being classy, very classy towards Peyton Manning. But uh, Andrew Luck really showing that he's not afraid to fill in the shoes that Peyton Manning left there. The uh, Colts are 5-2 and two right now, sitting pretty to win the division after the Titans have now lost two in a row. And 
the Texans are now lost. There's nowhere to be found. And then the Jaguars, the so they're Jaguars. So, yeah, I mean, you know. the, the Colts could have this division locked up maybe by the second week in November. Yeah. If they keep playing at this pace. But overall, I think Andrew Luck is really the catalyst to this team. As long as they have a running game to complement him, they're going to be hard to beat. Yeah. Um, Reggie Wayne going down is going to be big, mm-hmm. uh, big for them. But uh, I, I definitely think this game, for, for Denver, you know, I think it's a big – uh, kind of wake up call to that because you know they've just been on this roll where you know they've I, I feel like they've felt unstoppable. Like, I mean, you win all these games by that kind of, you know with those showings. You you have to besides that Dallas game. I mean, really none of them were close. So you, know, you feel like really nobody can stop you. So I think this is kind of a wake up call. Like, hey, we have to come into every game. You know, like like we need to play at our best to win this game. And I think for Indy though, I think it just solidifies their choice to get rid of Peyton in lieu of that number one pick because Peyton's going to be around for a couple more years. Mm-hmm. Andrew Luck has less weapons and still won that game. Andrew Luck came in in his first year, took the Colts that had a terrible year before, took them to the playoffs, and looks like he's going to take them back again this year. So in his first two seasons, it looks like he's going to take the Colts to back-to-back playoffs and – so he's basically just picking where, picking up where uh, Peyton Manning left off. And as long as he can do a little bit more with them than Peyton's been able to in the playoffs, I mean, when you look, I mean, Peyton Manning's one of the best quarterbacks in history, but when you look at it, took the Colts to the playoffs 11 times. I mean, when you count all his playoff appearances, so between the Colts and Denver, 12 playoff appearances, two Super Bowl appearances, one Super Bowl victory. I mean, if you if most quarterbacks only take their team to a Super Bowl or to the playoffs a few times in their career, and you know that's all they have. Peyton Manning was lucky enough to do it, you know, over a dozen to- about a dozen times, and only able to get one Super Bowl out of it. So I definitely think the Colts' decision to get rid of Peyton, bring in a- Andrew Luck, is probably the best decision they've made in a few years. Real quick note. You know, another quarterback that went to the playoffs his rookie season and the season after that? Big Ben. Oh, my God. And he won the Super Bowl that second season. <sighs> but but Pittsburgh was all about defense. All Big running. Ben had to do was not screw up. They had Jerome Bettis Yeah, and Tommy and a great did a fine defense. job of doing that until Big Ben mm-hmm. came in as a rookie and then a second-string or second-year quarterback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Big Ben. Oh, Big Ben. Go away. The World Series will begin on Wednesday with the Red Sox hosting the Cardinals. It's going to be the best versus the best as these two teams have had the best records in their respective leagues, and each of their top pitchers will be taking the mound on Wednesday. Cameron, what are your thoughts on this series? Um, I definitely think it's going to be a great series. Um, like you said, you know, best versus best. This is the first time in a while that we've seen uh, the two best teams in the league. Uh, when you look at records, I mean, generally the two teams in the World Series, you have to call them the two best teams because yep. they're in the World Series. But this is the first time in a while we've seen a team with the best record in each league <clears throat> get all the way to the World Series to face each other. Like we said, we're going to see John Lester versus Adam Wainwright, <clears throat> each team's best pitcher, power versus power, and it's just going to be up to uh, their bats to get it done. Um, I definitely think Boston has a better offense. You know, I think they're both very deep on the bench. Both have great bullpens, so uh, I definitely think it's going to be they're going to have to jump on the starters early, as early as they can, before they hand it over to that bullpen because we've seen both these bullpens just lock down on teams. You know, bullpen is what cost Detroit the ALCS. Bullpen is what won Boston the ALCS. Being able to bring in um, to um, oh, what's the setup man for Boston? The Asian one. Tazawa. Tazawa, to hand it over to Uahara, Craig Breslow, just all those relievers for Boston have been fantastic. Rosenthal closing it out for St. Louis. So it's definitely going to be on the offense to jump out on the starting pitching early. But, I mean, both teams have great starting pitching staffs. I mean, I think it's going to be a great series. I mean, I don't really know which team I want to root for because <laughs> I've never been a fan of any team from Boston or New England. And the Cardinals beat the Pirates in the playoffs. So <laughs> I don't really want to see them win either because I was at one of those games and we should have won it. And well, game four. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you still sour. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, at least your team was But any prediction? No. <laughs> I want both teams to just guess, blow up and I guess not exist anymore. I, I'll root for the Cardinals just because my roommates <coughs> are fans, so at least someone. And wins. wouldn't you rather have the team that beat you win the World Series yeah. and go, hey, at least we I lost guess. to the best team, you know, when you think about it. But but you, what you mentioned, you think Boston has a better offense. Uh, maybe, like, right now in the playoffs, what they've done so far compared to the Cardinals. But this Cardinals offense has been historically good. With the over 400 uh, batting average with runners in scoring position, Alan Craig putting up the highest batting average with runners in scoring position in a span of two years, higher than Paul Molitor, Ichiro Suzuki, Hank Aaron as well. Put, when you put up higher numbers than those guys in a regular season, you're doing something right. And I, you look in the lineup, almost everyone, one through eight for the Cardinals lineup, had about 70 plus RBIs in a season. Just they. They just knew how to produce runs, and that's going to be the key for Boston. It's just a just shut down whenever they get runners in scoring position, like limit the walks because the Cardinals can hit, and it's going to be up to the Boston power bats to secure the victory in the World Series with Boston in seven. Well, Boston also knows how to score runs because Boston was ranked number one in batting average and runs scored mm -hmm. in the American League. But I think the one big factor that's going to come into play is the timely hitting, which I think – when you look at this playoffs, um, Boston is has the benefit in that area because they've had to do it. Um, they've been down to you know the last inning and had to, or like you know with Big Poppy hitting the tie, the game tying grand slam and then having to walk off in the ninth inning. Um, the Cardinals, I think they're going to get a little more um, feel a little more defeated. I don't think they've really had to deal with that as much in these playoffs. So I think if they get down late, they're going to kind of hang their heads more than Boston will. Boston is, I think, a lot better at staying with it throughout the whole game, no matter the score. You know, whether it be three runs, four runs, you know, one run, they, they always feel like they're still in it. And I think they are. So I think that's going to be also one big factor. We've seen the timely hitting with Victorino's home run in the seventh, with Poppy's grand slam, and then Salto Lamacchia's game walk-off hit in the ninth. Um, I mean, they can hit in the clutch. Mm, you covered it, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all we have for you guys this week. I'm your host, Kristen Karam. Big thank you to our analysts. We have Big Dave Miller. Cameron Collins and Doug Drew, and we'll see you guys next week for the Rock Sports Show.